Courtney Crossway. <laughs> um, all glory to God for giving us another opportunity to come in together to this house, especially for me. Uh, every time I come to Dallas, I have to make my routine trip to Crossway. So it's like I've been part of this journey with this church from the very beginning, and I praise God for all that he has done through this church, uh, how he has grown y'all, and the work that y'all are doing in the Dallas area. Um, this week was a little different for me. I left the greatest city in the world, Houston, Texas, last Friday <clears throat> to attend the Farmer's Branch Youth Fellowship Retreat, and I had a, had a blessed time at that retreat. And instead of going back home like I usually do, I was actually here in Dallas uh, for this entire week because at this season of my life, God has called me uh, to pursue more educational training at Dallas Theological Seminary. So it was a rough week. Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 class every single day, including Independence Day. Um, but, you know, it was a great time also because I was able to spend more time in the Word and also spend time with friends and family here. Uh, thank you for all the love uh, and support and help. Uh, I was specifically Dimpu and his family. I was at their house for this past week. Uh, all the love and support they gave me, everyone who provided me with transportation this week, uh, I don't take that lightly. So thank you. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Uh, after worship today, I'll be returning home because I have tapped out on how long I could stay here. Um, so, okay, that's my last Dallas joke, I promise. I'm done. I'm finished. Um, as Sam mentioned, there are a lot of people here today, and I have to say something because God has been pressing it on my heart for the last couple of days, and I would be pretty disobedient to him if I didn't say it. Um, everyone that I hung out with this week, I feel like at the end of our hangout, it always ended with, oh, I'm coming a crossway on Sunday to hear you speak. Um, and, th and that's all good in the neighborhood, and I appreciate the love and support so much. Um, but whose house is this? It's God's house. It's not Jay Matthews, it's not Crossway's house, it's God's house. So if the people of God are gathered in the house of God, our one desire should be to hear from God. Um, you know, a lot of times churches, we, we, we treat our pastors like Israel viewed Moses. When Moses went up to Mount Sinai, the nation of Israel, they were, they were waiting to hear what Moses had to say. They were just waiting and waiting and waiting. I wonder what Moses has to say when he comes down from the mountain after meeting with God. And what God wants to say to you this morning is, you don't have to wait for Moses to come down from the mountain. And you don't even have to go up the mountain to hear from God. Because God descended himself in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, and he wants to meet with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to commune with you. He wants to speak to you. So my prayer for us this morning uh, is that we not be followers of a weak and sinful man, but followers of the blameless son and king, Jesus and that we could echo the words of Samuel when he prayed, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Amen? That wasn't my message, but um, that was just <laughs> that was an appetizer. Um, <laughs> if you could turn with me in your Bibles to the portion that Sam read for us this morning, Daniel chapter 6. We're going to be studying this chapter together, and obviously this is a very familiar passage, Daniel and the lion's den. And a lot of times what, what people do when we study a familiar passage is we subconsciously think, oh, Daniel and the lion's den, what could I possibly learn from that? I've, I've known that story my whole life. I've known it since I was a little kid. Uh, my five-year-old niece even knows that. I think she's here somewhere. I hope so. She's my ride home. Uh, and also, I miss her so much. It's been like 10 days since I've seen her. I have separation issues. So um, yeah, we, 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 we hear that we're speaking or learning from, from Daniel and the lines, then we think, what could we possibly learn? But I always tell people, if you approach the Word of God with reverence, humility, Expectance, expect, ah, expectancy and excitement, he will always teach you something. No matter how many times you open up the same passage, 
Have a sense of reverence. Have a sense of humility. Have expectation. Have excitement. And I promise you, God will speak to you. So before we get into the word, let's pause and let's just reflect uh, for a moment of prayer because we need his wisdom, his counsel, and I know I need his strength more than anything. So let's just bow for a moment for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to come into your house to enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise, to fellowship with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for new life through your son, Jesus Christ, that while we were still sinners, you allowed him to die for us so that we might be adopted into your family as sons and daughters. Thank you for your word, O Lord, that it is not just letters scribbled on pages of paper. It's not just history, but it's truth. It's alive, it's active, it's moving, and it desires to pierce our hearts and penetrate our lives to transform us. Father, I pray that our time in your word uh, will not be a time of information overload, but a time of transformation overload. Father, I pray for myself, I, you know, above all, that I am a weak person, I'm a sinful person, uh, but Father, I pray that you cleanse me. I pray that there is no sin in my life that stands in the way of your blessing to your people this morning, Father. Empower me, strengthen me, uplift me, encourage me so that I could be a spokesperson for you, Father. Father, I pray that you reveal yourself to your people in such a tangible way this morning that we could join in the psalmist when he said, I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Above all else, I pray, Father, that every word, every single word that comes out of my mouth in this time will ultimately point back to the word, your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name and by the power of your spirit that we pray. Amen. Most of you know that for the majority of my life, I've played the piano. Um, I started playing the piano at my home church of Trinity when I was in sixth grade. Actually, one of my best friends, Shanoi, he was on the drums and I was on the piano and we played for the very first time at Trinity in sixth grade and we were able to play there together for a good solid 15 years. And I remember over those 15 years, any time either of us heard a song that we really liked, we'd call each other up and we'd just be so excited talking about it, planning it, how we were going to debut that song in Trinity. And obviously, over 15 years, we were able to play a lot of new songs. And recently, we were reminiscing, because that's what you do when you get older, right? When you're younger, you think about the future. When you're older, you think about the past. So we were reminiscing on some of the older songs that we did and just how we miss doing some of those songs, and one of us mentioned a song that we actually did at Trinity when we were in sixth grade, a song called My Deliverer. We all know that song, right? My Deliverer is coming, my Deliverer is standing by. We loved that song. We were so hyped to do that song. We couldn't wait to do that song, and we debuted that song for the first time at Trinity on a Palm Sunday as the Sunday school kids made a triumphal entry into the church. And when we were reminiscing on the song a few months ago, I realized something tragic about the song. I realized that if Rich Mullins had never written that song back in 1997, and if it was written for the very first time today in 2018, the lyrics would be different. It would sing, my deliverance is coming, my deliverance is standing by, not my deliverer. Because we're living in a day and age where Christians have shifted our focus off of the deliverer and onto our deliverance. It's no longer about chasing after my deliverer, my Messiah, King Jesus. It's all about chasing after my deliverance. How can I get my deliverance and how can I get it as fast as I possibly can? There's people popping up left and right claiming to be deliverers who are leading the hearts and minds of many Christians away from the one and only deliverer. Christianity is difficult. Christian life has struggles, has trials. There's going to be times where you feel trapped and captured. But in those times, God wants to remind you this morning, don't chase after your deliverance. Chase after your deliverer. This morning, we're going to study the life of a man whose focus 
never shifted off of his deliverer, a man named Daniel. Now, we all know who Daniel was. He was a man who lived about 500 years before Christ and were first introduced to Daniel when he was 15 years old. Because when he was 15, because of the sinfulness of his nation, God allowed King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire to come capture the people of Israel. And Daniel was one of the exiles to Babylon when he was just 15 years old. And when you study the first five chapters in the book of Daniel, you see a reoccurring theme in his life. His uncompromised obedience to God. And because of his uncompromised obedience to God, God elevated him to become a very influential and powerful person in the government of Babylon. He served under King Nebuchadnezzar, and then he served under King Belshazzar. And here, in Daniel chapter 6, a new empire is in charge, a new king, King Darius and the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, knowing all of that about Daniel's life and where we are when we arrive to Daniel chapter 6, I want to use this time studying this chapter to unpack three experiences in the life of Daniel, a man whose eyes were always focused on his deliverer. That's where we're going this morning, okay? First of all, Daniel was a man who receives persecution in response to his faithfulness. Persecution in response to his faithfulness. Daniel was a faithful man. The text is going to teach us that he was a faithful man. How? First of all, he was a faithful man in his responsibilities, Faithful to his responsibilities. Okay, now when a government changes, when there's a transition in government, you know there is a transition period that's often very difficult. And if you study the history books, you'll see that when the Babylonian Empire was captured by the Persian Empire, there was a very difficult time of transition. History books tell us that it was a time of chaos, of confusion, civil disobedience. It was complete anarchy, and it was the responsibility of King Darius to restore restore order back into his kingdom. So what does he do? Daniel 6 tells us that he divides the kingdom into 120 provinces, okay? And over these 120 provinces, he appoints 120 satraps or princes to be in charge of those provinces. Then Darius selects three governors that would supervise these 120 satraps. One of those three governors is Daniel. Now, King Darius had heard of the wisdom and knowledge and discernment, the reputation of Daniel, so he made sure that he chose him. In fact, he had probably heard how Daniel accurately predicted the handwriting of God on the wall to King Belshazzar, that King Darius was even going to become the king and that their empire was going to overthrow the Babylonians. Knowing all of that about Daniel, King Darius makes him one of these three governors. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 tells us that very quickly, Daniel began to distinguish himself above all the other officials in the Persian Empire. The text tells us it is because he was excellent in spirit. Modern day translation, he had an excellent work ethic. Knowing that Daniel had an excellent work ethic, seeing the results of what he was doing, verse 4 tells us that King Darius planned to give Daniel a promotion. Okay. He gives, he's planning on giving him a promotion to make him the prime minister of Persia, making him second in command only to King Darius. Now that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because that's exactly what happened to Joseph because of his uncompromised obedience to God. When he was a slave in Egypt, he was promoted to be the governor under Pharaoh, second in command only to Pharaoh. The same thing is about to happen to Daniel. He's about to get a promotion. But this promotion, verse 4 tells us, didn't receive positive feedback. It got a negative reaction from his peers. Why? It could be because of jealousy. They were jealous that Daniel was about to be prime minister. It could also be because most of these satraps 
were Babylonians and Persians, and they're thinking, what is this exiled Jew going to be here in our land doing as prime minister? It could also be because they were not people of integrity. So all their responsibilities that they had to answer to Daniel, who was a man of integrity, would be much more difficult for them to do their jobs. Now, whatever those reasons were, his promotion received negative reaction from these men. So what did they do? Look at verse 4. It tells us that he, they begin to scrutinize the way he does his job. They begin to look at the way he governed. Because if they could find some sort of corruption, some sort of negligence in the way Daniel did his job, they could go to King Darius and say, hey, King Darius, you should probably rethink that promotion. But what does the text say in verse 4? That no matter how deep they dug, no matter how hard they tried, they found no grounds for accusation against him. Why? Because he was faithful. They walked away saying, we can find no fault in him. That's exactly what Pilate said about Jesus when Jesus was on trial. And that's why Daniel's often referred to as an Old Testament typology to Jesus. They could find no fault in him. Why? Because he was faithful in his responsibilities. Now what about us today? If people began to dig deep into our lives, began to scrutinize the way we do our job or our responsibilities, would they walk away saying we can find no fault in them? That's why Paul commands us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as to the Lord. If you're sitting here this morning, whether you're a doctor, engineer, pharmacist, nurse, IT professional, teacher, student, it doesn't matter. Wherever God has placed you in this season of your life to serve, he is commanding you to be so faithful to that responsibility that even if your enemies dug deep, they would walk away saying, we could find no fault in that. Daniel was faithful in his responsibilities. But not only was Daniel faithful in his responsibilities, he was faithful to his God. Look at verse 5. When they realized they could find no fault in the way he did his governing, they began to attack his faith. And they began to compare the faith of Daniel to the law of the Medes and Persians, and they saw no discrepancies. They saw no contradictions. So what do they do? Evil men began to change the law to make it immoral to do what is righteous. For weeks, for months, they scheme, and they come in verses 6 through 9 before uh, King Darius. And they say to Darius, O oh, King Darius, all the prefects, all the counselors, all the satraps, all the governors, we think you should pass this law. Now, first of all, that was a lie because Governor Daniel wasn't even part of this little meeting, was he? And they say to him, we think you should pass this law. That for 30 days, nobody in your empire is allowed to make petition or pray to any other individual or any god other than you, King Darius. And if they do, if they break your law, they will be thrown into the lion's den so that they can be executed. And, oh, King Darius, you know that when you pass a law in the Persian Empire, it cannot be changed. Now, why did they include that little caveat that they could pray to Darius? That's pretty important. They were trying to pull at the heartstring of Darius's ego. See, they were trying to treat Darius like a god because if people could pray to Darius, they were acknowledging that they were placing their trust in Darius to provide them with anything and everything that they needed. So Darius immediately signs the law. And the enemies of Daniel wait to see what Daniel does. Now, they already knew what Daniel was going to do. They knew Daniel was going to disobey this law, which is the only reason why they even changed the law in the first place. How did they know? Because Daniel's faithfulness to God wasn't a private faithfulness. 
He was public in his faithfulness to God. We've seen that through the whole first five chapters of Daniel chapter, uh, of the book of Daniel. If you flip over to Daniel chapter 1, you see that we're introduced to Daniel for the very first time as a 15-year-old boy, as an exile, and King Nebuchadnezzar decides that he's going to pick some of the young men to put them through this training process. He wants them to be trained, to be re-identified with the empire of Babylon. And part of this training process is that they had to eat food from the king's table. Now that sounds like a pretty sweet deal, doesn't it? But Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 tells us that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Now how was he going to defile himself by eating food from the king's table? Because in that moment, Daniel remembered what God commanded the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 34, verses 14 through 16, not to eat food sacrificed to false gods. Now Daniel could have easily said, this is just a provision of God in the midst of my suffering. God, you're just providing for me in my difficult time. Steak and wine from the king's table, that sounds like a sweet deal. That's not what Daniel did. Why? Because he was faithful to his God, and it was so public that even his enemies knew it. How public are you in your faithfulness to God? Are you a closet Christian, or do people know about it? You know how you can answer that question? How persecuted are you? How persecuted are you for your faithfulness to God? Because how faithful you are to God publicly will determine how persecuted you are by his enemies. God guarantees in his scriptures that when you live a life of public faithfulness to God, you will be persecuted. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, that evil men will make up accusations and lies against you when you try to live for righteousness. Paul commands us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that indeed all who desire to live a life of godliness to Jesus Christ will be persecuted. So God is asking you to examine your life this morning. And ask yourself, how much persecution are you going through? Maybe, just maybe, if you're not going through much, it's because you are not public in your faithfulness to God. Daniel was a man who was faithful in his responsibilities, publicly faithful to his God, and in response, he receives persecution. Secondly, we see that Daniel is a man who relies on prayer in response to persecution. He relies on prayer in response to his persecution. Can someone read verse 10? Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. And I want you all to pay close attention because from this one verse, we see so many principles about the prayer life of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. First thing you see, thank you. The first thing you see about Daniel's prayer life from that verse is that it was an unshakable prayer life. Look at verse 10. It starts off by saying that he found out that this law had been passed. In that moment that Daniel found out that the law had been passed, he had options. He could have obeyed the law by praying to Darius. He could have obeyed the law by not praying for 30 days. He could have went and talked to Darius. They were boys. They could have talked it out and figured out a loophole in the system. Uh, he could have prayed in a more private, secluded part of his house. He could have prayed within his heart. You know, a good old-fashioned silent prayer. He could have done that for 30 days. But the text tells us that he prayed as he always had. That shows that this prayer was not a reaction prayer to the law, but it was a prayer life that he always had, an unshakable prayer life. It's almost like Daniel heard this law was passed and shrugged his shoulders and said, I'm going to do what I always do. Because the law of a worldly king was not going to phase Daniel away from praying to the king of kings. I love what one Bible scholar says. He says, in this story, the real lion's den was Daniel's prayer chamber. 
because that's where he fought the battle and that's where he won his victory. So when he faced the real lions, it didn't even phase him. An unshakable prayer life. If we wake up tomorrow morning and the Supreme Court has passed a law making it illegal to pray in public places of worship, what will we do? That day is coming real quickly in this country. What will we do? Believe me, we'll have options just like Daniel. Will we sign on to our social media accounts and just vent about it to the world? Will we go to the streets and protest? Will we write letters to our congressmen? Will we start having prayer meetings in our houses? Or will we just pray like we always have? No matter where you are, who you are with, what the circumstance is, and what the consequences may be, remain unshakable in your faith. Remain unshakable in your prayer life. Daniel had an unshakable prayer life. Not only was it unshakable, though, it was a disciplined prayer life. It was a disciplined prayer life. In verse 10, it tells us that he knelt down, opened up the windows of his house, went to his prayer chamber, faced Jerusalem, and prayed three times a day. Okay, there's a lot in there. Let's unpack that. Why was he facing Jerusalem? That wasn't meaningless, okay? It wasn't because he missed home. It was actually out of obedience, because in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 46 to 51, we see an event known as the dedication of Solomon's temple. And when Solomon dedicates the temple of God in Jerusalem back in 1 Kings, he prays a prayer that says, God, if your people of Israel uh, will rebel against you and commit sin and you allow them to be captured by a foreign nation, if they will repent and if they will pray facing this city, you will will deliver them. So it wasn't because he missed Jerusalem. It wasn't a meaningless reason why he was facing Jerusalem. It was out of obedience. He knelt and he faced Jerusalem and prayed not once, not twice, but three times a day. See, if I printed out a job description of what Daniel had to do as a governor in Persia, it would be pages long. It'd be longer than anything any of us have to do in this room. I guarantee it. But he wasn't too busy to pray. He started off every morning coming to God, seeking prayer, uh, seeking guidance from God in prayer. He came back at noontime seeking strength from God in prayer. He came back in the evening seeking rest from God in prayer. He had a disciplined prayer life. Now, we hear that today, and we think, oh, Jay, that's just a ritual. I'm not all about that ritual life, Jay. <laughs> First of all, it's only a ritual if you make it a ritual. And I guarantee you this wasn't a ritual for Daniel. He longed to pray. He yearned to commune with his Father in heaven. Nothing was going to stand in the way of his prayer time. And that's hard for us to wrap our minds around because we live in a prayerless generation. If you study church history, the way our church prays today is pathetic. That's the reality. We live in a prayerless generation. Statistics show that the average time that a Christian prays today is when they go and post on Facebook saying thoughts and prayers for. And if you think you have a prayer life because of that, you're fooling yourself. All you did is you thought about praying. I was leading a young family's Bible study in Houston, and uh, it was with the fathers, with the men. And one of the men in the room during that Bible study, man, he said a profound statement that I will never forget. He confessed to us. He was like, guys, when I was a little kid, I remembered my upachin would wake up 5 o'clock in the morning, and he would pray for two hours, and he would wake the whole house up. And as I grew older, I noticed that my parents woke up every single morning 5 o'clock to pray for two hours, and it woke us all up. And then he confessed to us, but guys, I struggle to have an inconsistent 10 minutes with God every single day. But the next statement he said is what got me. He said, we are who we are and where we are because of those two-hour prayers. 
but my kids are who they are and where they are because of my inconsistent 10-minute prayers. Parents in the room, hear me loud and clear. Your children are not in danger in this world because of weapons of warfare. Your children are in danger because you as parents are not utilizing the most powerful weapon of prayer. He had an unshakable, disciplined prayer life. Finally, you see that his prayer life was a prayer of thanksgiving. Verse 10 tells us that he gives thanks to God. This dude just found out that he has disobeyed the law and he's about to go into the lion's den, but when he prays, what does he pray? He doesn't pray, Lord, save me, Lord, help me, Lord, deliver me. He just gives thanks. He says, dear God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your faithfulness, that your mercies are new every morning, that your faithfulness never comes to an end. Thank you for bringing me to Babylon. Thank you for elevating me here. Thank you for protecting me here. And thank you in advance for what you're about to do here. It was a prayer of thanksgiving. In the midst of our struggles, when you feel trapped, when you feel captured, when you feel like you need deliverance, look at Daniel's life and remind yourself that your prayer should be a prayer of thanksgiving. That's why we read this morning, I think during the intercessory time, let your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. Daniel was a man. When he receives persecution, he relies on prayer, an unshakable, disciplined prayer of thanksgiving. Finally, he experiences deliverance in response to his prayer. Deliverance in response to his prayer. Look at verse 14. The satraps come, they tell King Darius, hey Darius, didn't you just pass this law that if anyone prays, they'll be thrown into the lion's den? And he says, oh, why, yes, I did. And they say, hey, your boy Daniel just broke the law. And verse 14 tells us that when King Darius finds this out, immediately he is distressed. He is troubled within him, and he is determined to find a way to deliver Daniel. Darius realizes he's messed up, that this was all just a trap from jealous people who were trying to kill Daniel. So he's pacing back and forth in his palace. He's searching through the books, trying to find a little loophole, some fine print in that law. And the satraps come and remind him, hey, Darius, don't forget, a Persian law can't be overturned. But he doesn't care. He's determined to save and deliver his friend. But eventually, when the sun has gone down, he realizes he can't deliver Daniel. There's nothing he can do. And he orders that Daniel be thrown into the lion's den, and he rolls a stone in front of that den and seals it with his ring, the same ring that he used to seal this law. And he has one final word for Daniel. May your God, whom you continually serve, deliver you from the lion's den. See, the deliverance that Daniel was going to experience would not take place at human hands. Why? Something important. God wasn't going to allow Darius to deliver Daniel. Why? Remember the law. If you prayed, you could pray to Darius, meaning you were putting your trust in Darius to provide anything and everything for you. Daniel disobeys the law, meaning he wasn't putting his trust in Darius. He was putting his trust in God to provide anything and everything for him. So if Daniel was putting his trust in God, God was not going to allow King Darius to deliver Daniel. Who you place your trust in is who will deliver you. If you want to experience uh, deliverance for the glory of God... Put your trust in God and God alone. And that's exactly, exactly what Daniel does. What do we do, though? We pray, God, you're the only one who can save me. God, I trust in you and you alone. And then when we say amen, we go call somebody to see how they could help us. Not Daniel. He didn't just pray the prayer. He placed his complete trust in God, which is exactly why God didn't allow Darius to deliver him. It was going to be a deliverance that only God could bring. Look at verses 20 to 23. We see how beautiful this deliverance is. 
tells us that King Darius couldn't sleep that night. He was so worried about his friend. He's pacing back and forth in his bedroom. He's tossing and turning. And early in the morning, he rushes to the lion's den. And with a voice of anguish, he cries out, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you continually served delivered you from the lion's den? Darius wasn't expecting an answer. That's why he had a voice of anguish. Imagine how shocked he was. How relieved he was, how overjoyed he was when he heard Daniel's voice. And Daniel paints a picture of how God delivered him. It's such a beautiful picture that, that evil men and these soldiers from Persia throw Daniel into the lion's den. And I want you to picture this with me because it's beautiful. And Daniel's thrown into the lion's den, and all these lions who are in the back of the den realize they have some fresh meat. So they come running as fast as they can, roaring as loud as they can, ready to tear Daniel up, when all of a sudden, God Almighty, who sits on the throne in heaven, says, King Darius, watch my deliverance. I'm the one who created those lions, so I'm the one who's going to shut their mouths. He says, angel of mine, go down there and shut the mouths of those lions. And all of a sudden, God's angel comes and shuts the mouth of those lions, and the lion's demeanor changes. They're no longer racing toward Daniel. They're no longer roaring. I could picture some of those lions snorting and then going back to where they were in the first place. I could picture some of those lions coming up with friendliness to Daniel. I could picture some of those lions giving him warmth, serving him as a blanket and a pillow that night in that dark, cold den. King Darius, in his royal, luxurious palace, couldn't sleep because he had no peace. But Daniel had a perfect night of sleep and peace. Why? Because he trusted in God. Verse 23 tells us, because he trusted in God, he walked out of that lion's den without even a scratch. God wanted the nation of Israel to understand very, uh, something very important through this story. They, too, were still captives. They, too, were still exiles. And he wanted them to know that if they would place their trust in God and God alone, he would deliver them. Today, 2018, God wants you to know that if you are a captive to sin, that if you will place your trust in God and God alone, he will deliver you. That if you're sitting here today and you're experiencing captivity and you feel trapped because the attacks of Satan, who is like a roaring lion, that God will deliver you if you will place your trust in him and him alone because who you place your trust in is who will deliver you I love what the songwriter says faith makes a fool of what makes sense it believes when it is absolutely impossible to believe Daniel experiences a great deliverance not at human hands but the hands of an almighty God and because of that, God gets the glory. Look what happens. The story closes. See, I believe that this deliverance from God, it was to prove Daniel's innocence. But most importantly, it was for God to get all the glory. Because what God desires more than anything else is his glory. King Darius orders that these enemies who made this law and their wives and their children be thrown into the lion's den. Because in Persian law, if you were guilty, your whole family was guilty. So they're thrown into the lion's den. And even before they get to the bottom of the den, these hungry lions who didn't get to eat all night come and devour them, break their bones into pieces. And then you see a beautiful decree in verses 25 through 27. King Darius writes a new law and he says to all the world that all people of all nations, of all languages in the entire world should fear and tremble before the one true God, the God of Daniel, the God who delivered Daniel from the lion's den. Maybe, just maybe, God allowed the nation of Israel to be exiles so that this decree could take place. Maybe, just maybe, God allowed Darius and the Persian army to overthrow the Babylonians so that this decree could take place. Maybe, just maybe, God allowed Daniel to be captured and trapped in the lion's den so that this decree could take place, so that it could be declared throughout the entire world that God and God alone was the one true God. My question for you this morning 
is when you experience deliverance in your life, how much glory is God getting for it? When you experience deliverance in your life, is it known to the world that it is God who delivered you? When you experience deliverance in your life, are people coming to Jesus? Are people's faith in God being strengthened? What God desires more than anything is his glory. And if we place our trust in him and experience his deliverance, he will get all the glory. There was a lifeguard who was working at a swimming pool one summer. And he noticed that an elderly man fell into the pool and was drowning. So the lifeguard, he, he jumps into the pool and swims as fast as he can to this man. But when he's about four feet away from the man, he takes a step back and just waits there. Because he notices that this man is freaking out. He's so scared. He's so afraid. He's trying to deliver himself. He's flailing his arms around, kicking around, trying to, to deliver himself. But nothing's taking place. All that's happening is he's wasting energy. And the lifeguard is just waiting there. <laughs> Not because he doesn't care about the man, but he realizes he cannot deliver the man unless the man stops trying to deliver himself. Eventually, the man loses all energy and he gives up. He stops relying on his own strength, his own abilities, his own methods. And instantly, the lifeguard pops into action. He swims over to this man, cups his hand under his chin, puts, a sh uh, puts his elbow into his shoulder blade, bringing the man up to the surface and ultimately delivering him from that pool. When the man is finally calmed down, he sincerely thanks the lifeguard and he walks around that entire pool telling all his family and friends how the lifeguard delivered him. He couldn't take credit for it because when he was trying, he was failing. But the moment he stopped trying to deliver himself, he experienced deliverance. And the lifeguard was the only one who got the credit. <laughs> See, when the people of God place their full trust in God, they will experience deliverance from God for the glory of God. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us this morning, O Lord. Father, I pray for individuals in this room who feel like they are captures, who feel like they are trapped, who feel like they need deliverance. Father, in that moment, O Lord, help them to keep their eyes focused on their deliverer. Father, I pray that we will be like Daniel, people who are faithful wherever you place us, people who are public in our faithfulness to you. But help us to understand that when that happens, we will be persecuted. But Father, if we have an unshakable, disciplined prayer life, the persecution won't faze us. Instead, it will strengthen our faith and trust in a God who desires to deliver us for his glory. Father, I pray that your word takes root in good soil this morning to produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold for your kingdom. That we will leave this place not just hearers of this word, agreeers to this word, believers in this word, but committed obeyers to this word. That's in your son's name. And by the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen.